So hi, we're back for our second spotlight session of the night. It is an honor to be here with the lawyer and advocate Kevin DeLevon. He is working with the Economic Justice Group at Legal Aid in Arkansas. And he primarily works with low-income communities on issues around disability rights, health, and education. And I really got to know your work first through the Litigating Algorithms uh, conference where we met and I was hearing about these amazing cases that you've been working on. But I thought maybe we'd start with our you know, time on the clock um, by asking about this extraordinary case you've been working on around Medicaid in Arkansas. Yeah, so legal aid attorneys, we are in the trenches helping people who don't have money and can't afford lawyers with their day-to-day -day civil legal needs. So it could be domestic violence or it could be complicated things like health and Medicaid um, and algorithms. And so folks come to us when there's no other option. So what we were seeing is early 2016, we started getting an inordinate number of calls of people complaining of the same issue. And this is what it was is Medicaid will pay for a caregiver to come into somebody's home who has physical disabilities and provide care, help with eating, bathing, turning, getting out of bed, and so forth. And um, people were calling and saying, I've been getting eight hours a day of care for 15 years. Somebody just came and they said the computer told me I can only get five hours a day of care. And so what we learned was actually happening is that the state of Arkansas had instituted algorithms to decide how much in-home care people were going to get. And these led to drastic, drastic cuts. The best case scenario is five and a half hours a day of care. And for somebody who has cerebral palsy, somebody who has quadriplegia, or various other advanced physical ailments, that meant you're lying in your own waist. It meant you're going without food. It meant you're getting pressure sores because there's nobody to turn you and other things that were just totally, totally inhumane um, and didn't make a lot of sense because staying at home is not only better for your dignity, it's also generally better for the state's bottom line because it costs a lot less than nursing home care. Yeah, I mean, tell me how you've actually sort of started to investigate this. I mean, obviously when people say, hey, there's a new algorithmic system, how do you look into it? Well, so this is the thing is the state didn't give us anything. All we knew is that clients were telling us the, comp the nurses that come out and ask me the questions are saying that the computer did it. And so <laughs> they're like, wait, the computer did it. The computer did it. What happened? Uh, and so we finally, through litigation, we got the algorithm, which is 21 pages, single space computer code. I have no background in coding. So my evenings were just spent going, OK, x sub 1, if x sub 1 less than or equal to x sub 8 minus 2, right, like then such and such. Um, and so it was just a lot of cozy time with the algorithm in the evenings. <laughs> so did you teach yourself to code? Like, how did you how did you begin to translate it? No, I have no coding or math background. If you asked me to write a computer program, I would say, "Hey, here's my friend Kate." Um, <laughs> um, but I could. It's a bunch of if-then statements, and with enough focus and um, practice, I learned, and I got to the point where if somebody gave me an assessment that was completed, I could figure out where they would fall in the in the algorithm. So how do we start to build in accountability for systems like this? I mean, obviously, you had to go through discovery just to see this algorithm. And then you have to try and like look at it and figure out what's going on. I mean, what does accountability look like there? Yeah, um, it's not just lawyers in suits carrying big sledgehammers. Though that's a big part of it. Um, the big thing that we really wanted to focus on is we knew that no judge is probably going to tell the state, look, you have to provide eight hours a day of care, which is barely enough, by the way you know, if everything is perfect. But no judge is going to sit here and say, OK, you have to provide eight hours a day of care, or you have to provide 10, or whatever it might be. They might say to the state, no, you can't cut down to such and such, right? Or no, you can't cut. But they're not going to build policy. So we knew from the start the limits of litigation. Now, that's an important thing. So what we did is we used the litigation as a rallying point for a massive public education campaign that engaged the people most affected. So what we did is we put out educational information we did all sorts of presentations. We produced videos of our clients' lives, of course, with their consent and ultimate approval. And all this information actively pushed through social media, through traditional media, and so forth, ended up empowering our clients to take that and then go run with it. So they were calling legislators. They were doing change.org petitions to the governor. They were getting together in Facebook groups and kind of doing some mutual aid sharing. And so once you have that the people most affected being most activated, complemented 
by litigation and then presumably complemented by policy analysis and everything else, you've got some sort of structure to make sure that substantive justice prevails, right? That the people, my clients, some of whom are watching, get the care they need, not that we just default to some sort of procedural fairness um, kind of posture. Excellent. And tell me, like, how do you think lawyers and researchers can work together better on these issues? Yeah, and this is, this is key. So I figured out the mechanics of the algorithm. Like, I figure out how a can opener works, right? Like, I, I figure out how to open a can with it, but it doesn't mean that I could build one. It doesn't mean that I understand it. And that's where the researchers come in is understanding, is the algorithm validated? Does it measure what it purports to measure? Is the software that implements it correct? Are all the projections and underlying assumptions on point? And that's the information that I was lacking that actually limited my legal challenge to more procedural bases that I thought I could win because I didn't know how to prove or I didn't have the expertise to prove right away, hey, this algorithm is crap, right? Like it doesn't do what it's supposed to do and it's really arbitrary. I could just track the ways it was arbitrary, but I couldn't do much more than that. Yeah, I, I feel like I, you know, you're kind of burying the lead here because the exciting thing is what actually happened in the case. Like, how did it resolve? Okay, so uh, it's a win. All right, Liz. Yay! Yay! <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> yeah, but you, you know, all us do-gooders, we we have very limited <laughs> ability to just appreciate wins because we know that the next terrible thing is like right behind the stage <laughs> curtain, right over there. Not Meredith. <laughs> but, uh, uh, so what we did is we invalidated the algorithm um, ultimately then the state wanted to bring it back because they said look we've been using this illegal thing for so long that we have no other way to do it other than to keep using the illegal thing and they held thousands of people hostage and said we're not going to provide them services if you don't let us do this so the legislature let them reinstate it for two months but the legislature also said, this algorithm, which is called RUGS, is not holistic. We don't want it for the people of Arkansas. It's gone. So that algorithm is dead and gone and on its way out. So what's the state going to do in January? Another algorithm. Yeah, and so we're hoping that at that point, not only uh, are we smarter, we're hoping that the states learn some lessons. And now we're in a position where we've got more resources, we've got knowledge, we've got activated community members, where we can go and, and transmit the message to the state, look, do right by people, because you're not gonna wear us out, you're not gonna outwork us, we're not going away, we're smarter than you, and we're coming for you. <laughs> It is, it is such a pleasure to hear about this work and it's, it's really been extraordinary to meet you and so many of the public interest lawyers who are making these differences. Can you please give a big round of applause to Kevin? And I hate to say it, but we're now facing our final panel for the night. I, I think we could keep going for, for many hours, but we're gonna, um, we're gonna close out with one last panel. This panel is about the relationships between research, activism, and accountability. And would you please welcome Meredith Whitaker, who will be chairing my co-founder in all things.